Well, good day, everyone, and welcome to our webinar today, Healthcare Food Service Solutions and the Use of Interim Kitchen Facilities to Address Those Solutions. We have a couple of presenters to share the information with you today. First of all, Ralph Goldbeck, myself. I am one of the partners of Kitchens to Go and Carlin Manufacturing. I've been involved in the food service industry for a little over 26 years. Uh, my background is I'm an architect by trade and have uh, transitioned that over into our business. Uh, joining me today is Scott Carroll. Scott, would you introduce yourself, please? Hi, this is Scott Carroll. Uh, I've got 30 years experience um, and I have a proven uh, background in innovation and strategic uh, planning in multiple industries. I've been with Kitchens to Go and Carlin Manufacturing since 2006. And as a hobby, I, uh, I'm a paramedic as well. So uh, my background here with Kitchens to Go, I have eight years, as I said, eight years with the company. I've been director of operations and I've spent the last two and a half years on the sales side. Scott, you look much too young to have 30 years of experience. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, and real quick, a commercial for uh, Kitchens to Go. We are sponsoring our webinar today. Kitchens to Go is an industry leader in the uh, production of mobile and modular food service solutions, both for sale and for interim solutions. We are a proud member of AHF, the Association for Healthcare Food Service. Scott and I just had the opportunity last week to spend a week down in Orlando with our friends with AHF. It was a great conference. The uh, theme of the conference this year was leading in a time of change. And with the Affordable Care Act uh, affecting, of course, healthcare, uh, the food service folks definitely are having to lead in a time of change. They're being asked to do more with less, and it's a challenge for everyone. So great conversation. Always nice to catch up with our industry friends and, and see what they're up to. The products that uh, Kitchens to Go provides are built by our affiliated company, Carlin Manufacturing. Carlin was the 2012 recipient of the Kitchen Innovation Award at the NRA Show for its bolt-on kitchen concept, which we'll speak to a bit uh, further in the presentation. Our agenda today, uh, we've got some points we want to cover with you all. Um, some of the key items are, what is a temporary kitchen? What are your options for temporary food service? Uh, what are the planning, approval, timeline, and costs involved? What are some of the benefits of a temporary kitchen solution? And obviously, after having spent last week at the AHF conference, as Ralph mentioned, uh, food service is even playing a greater role in the hospital industry because of uh, the uh, changes uh, that have occurred. And also, temporary, ki temporary kitchen solutions in action. Uh, at the end, we will have a question and answer period. And if you can, if uh, there is an area where you can type in your questions. Uh, that's the only way we'll be able to answer those for you. There isn't uh, two-way speak on this conference. So if you can type in any of your questions, Ralph and I will be happy to address all your questions at the end of the conference. So we go on to what is a temporary kitchen? Um, in our world, temporary kitchen, are there, we have both mobile and modular culinary production units. Um, they're utilized to replace or supplement existing facilities during a time of closure, renovation, or disaster recovery, um, and they're scalable. Uh, we can make them uh, very small. We have everything in our fleet from a little 8x20 bumper pull trailer, that's like a U-Haul, all the way up to complexes that we've done as large as 36,000 square feet for 18 months. That was not in healthcare. That was for the U.S. Naval Academy. We did that a few years ago. I ran that project. And uh, we put in 36,000 square feet at the Naval Academy for 18 months and served over 6 million meals. So we can do everything from a small event all the way up to something like that. I kind of shared what a temporary kitchen is. Uh, the temporary kitchens that are available are really made up uh, by a number of different types of solutions. Uh, first of all, mobile units, which are normally used for short term, anywhere from one to six months. They're very mobile. They can be dispatched within 24 hours uh, of an event, and they can come in, be set up quickly, and operate for a short interim period. If you have a longer-term requirement, uh, we would suggest a modular solution, typically anywhere from six months plus up to a number of years. Uh, modular units allow for increased capacity and volume production. They connect together to provide a nice open space for good verbal and visual communications and they can also be used for disaster recovery programs. 
There are also containerized solutions available. These are very similar to the mobile units. They are also used for short term. They are a little more cost effective to move around the country. They can be lifted easily with a crane and put into some uh, tight conditions. I spoke earlier about the bolt-on solution. A bolt-on solution is very similar to a modular solution. It is actually designed to be actually bolted on to an existing facility. So if you have some space that you can capture to use for a server or for a dining space, these bolt-on kitchens can be shipped to the site and actually bolted onto the existing space to create your interim food service solution. What types of solutions are available? Um, one thing I just want to take a step back, Ralph was talking about disaster relief. Obviously, uh, there is a considerable amount of uh, conversation that was last week at AHF about disaster relief and a disaster occurring at a uh, health facility. And next week, we have our initial conversations with one of the larger uh, chains in the Ohio area to discuss how we can better service those folks in regards to being able to develop different levels of response in different sizes of complexes. But what types of solutions are available beyond typical kitchens? And as you can see by the list, uh, there's cold and dry storage, um, tray lines, dishwash modules, uh, dining facilities, toilets and locker rooms, office space, trash rooms, and recycling centers, and power generation and distribution. There's a project that we are in the process of installing. It happens to be a permanent project for a mental health facility out on the south suburbs of Chicago, which is taking into account just about everything on that list except for the power generation and distribution. So we have the ability to service all aspects of your needs. So now that we've uh, talked about what a temporary kitchen is and what type of solutions are available, we'll take some time to look into the actual facts, uh, the planning, the preparation, and probably most importantly, the investment, uh, what the solutions will cost. Okay. The facts in regards to planning, um, you need to initiate planning process as early as possible, and we can't emphasize that enough. Uh, many times projects come up and they have a very, very short lead time, and we are capable of meeting all of those. But at the same time, you know, as we all know, planning creates a much better project. So as you can see by the, the timeline that we're showing, um, there's a number of components from programming to code approvals and production and delivery and installation and testing and training. You know, the total lead time we're looking at is from 5 to 18 weeks. Uh, one of the wild cards in that, and Ralph will speak more to it, is the code approvals. You know, with today, particularly in healthcare, uh, you have state approvals, local approvals, health department approvals. Uh, that can sometimes drag on a little bit more. So the key really is, as early as possible, begin the planning process and have the conversation. Even if it's very preliminary, uh, it gets us into the position of being able to meet your timelines because at the end, the timeline is really what's critical. And as Scott shared, the, the code approval process is a key component to the schedule, and it can vary greatly based upon the uh, levels of approvals that you have to go through. The entire process is very similar to what you would experience in the uh, build-out of a new facility on your campus, on your hospital site, but it's for an interim solution. You still need to go through your local health department, environmental health department, and your state, county, and or city building departments to secure approval. Uh, we provide a complete set of engineer drawings. We have architects and engineers on staff that will provide the necessary documents to hand off to your professional team to carry through the approval process. Then once uh, your permits are secured, then the, the gear is moved on to site and the interim uh, kitchen program then begins. What does this cost? I mean, that's b bottom line. You know, the first question everybody wants to ask, they, you get on the phone with somebody, they're going, I know I haven't told you too much about what my project's all about, but I need to know how much this is going to cost. So there, here, these are just some budgetary numbers to look at. That's if you were to rent each individual unit unto itself. When we put together complexes for people, we end up with more of a blended price because you, you know, a typical project may be one cook unit, a prep unit with a tray line, you know, a dishwash module, and two or three coolers and freezers, possibly dining space. When you start putting it all together, you know, there are costs that can be saved because you are using larger space and it allows us to reduce the overall price. 
but this just kind of gives you a, a snapshot of what each one of those individual modules or components would cost. Beyond that, we also have one-time charges, which include the freight installation and removal. We separate those numbers because what we want you to understand is here's the cost that's going to be one time, and here's the cost for the rent. You know, I know it has never happened on anybody's project that a construction job has gone long. If we were to include those numbers in with our monthly rent, you would be paying over and over again for the install and dismantle and transportation. So what we do is we break those numbers out so that you see what those numbers are. They are fixed numbers, and the rent will be what the rent is as we go forward. So. And Scott, we've been tossing around the term temporary kitchen or interim kitchen through this presentation. It's really a key point. We have found that uh, it helps to possibly use the word interim in the presentation of this solution, especially to uh, the admin folks. Uh, these are not uh, inexpensive complexes, but for a period of time, even though they're there on a temporary or interim basis, they are your permanent kitchen. They will replace your existing production facilities and will have to meet the volume and quality production demands that your existing kitchen currently provides, and this will take its place for a period of time. So uh, very important to, to understand the value and the uh, requirements of the solutions being provided so that it can justify the budget that's required to put this in place. And, and Ralph, one other point. Uh, as I've spoken to a number of people on the phone, uh, often I get the question, well, what happens if our project runs over and we have a three-month lease? Uh, be safe and comfortable to understand as long as somebody's paying their bill, uh, we will leave a complex on site for as long as it is needed. And that has sometimes, there, there's a, a competition within the company kind of tongue in cheek where who, who has the contract or the, the project that has extended more than anybody else. I think actually Ralph currently owns the record at somewhere around 30 something months. But be that as it may, you know, you know projects do run over, we do appreciate that and we have never removed the complex from somebody from underneath them if their project isn't complete. So Scott, when does it make sense to uh, purchase as opposed to lease? Well, typically that would happen at about an 18 month. We, we talk about 18 to 24 months is a break even point for when somebody is taking a look at a project and saying, gee, should I rent this or should I lease it? Uh, the other pieces are particularly in the picture we're looking at right now is a sprung structure. This is University of South the University of Southern California. And uh, what they did was they actually purchased the sprung structure because they repurposed it into other uses for a significant period of time after the kitchens were removed. And in fact, they bought a couple of our modules because they had bathrooms in it to support the sprung structure. So it was there for a, a significant period of time afterwards, at which point it was ultimately dismantled and sold off. Um, also, disaster preparedness applications. Uh, we've done some projects with the Federal Bureau of Prisons where they've actually bought units. They use them for renovation if they're renovating one of their prisons, but at the same time, they have them on site in case there is a disaster. This happened particularly after Katrina, and then as Ralph spoke earlier about the bolt-on program. Another key component of the price of a complex has to do with utilities and the extension of utilities to the site that's chosen for the interim kitchen program. Uh, these kitchen complexes require roughly the same amount of utility that your existing kitchen would use, whether it's electrical, gas, water, and uh, waste generation. So it's important to plan and to get out on site and find out where those utilities are going to come from and how far they will have to be extended. Of course, the longer the extension, the higher the cost to do so. In some cases, we've shifted over from natural gas to propane to allow for a propane tank to be dropped near the temporary kitchen facility. Another key component of the cost structure has to do with equipment. These uh, kitchens use commercial grade food service equipment, of course NSF and UL approved, just like your permanent kitchen would. The exhaust hoods have certified fire suppression systems and tempered makeup air. Uh, in some cases we can utilize some of your existing equipment, for instance in healthcare food service. You will normally have a tray line in your facility. If you have an existing tray line that your staff is familiar with, we can relocate that and put it into the interim facility. Or if you're looking to purchase a new tray line for your new facility, we can uh, take delivery of that early, put it in place, and get your staff trained and up to speed before the new facility is completed. So a number of uh, flexible, uh, creative ways to address 
the cost of equipment and to address the overall budget. All right, Ralph, so we've talked about all the different options they have. We've talked about purchase versus lease. Um, you know, we're talking about, we want to talk about weighing your options. So, so how do folks weigh their options? Well, when you have to shut down your um, main facility or you're looking at a renovation and it's going to happen in, in the same location that uh, uh, the construction is going to take place, what are your options? Well, probably the most common option is to phase the construction. And we've seen this happen uh, uh, throughout the country, and we believe that it's really a more expensive solution. It can take two to three times longer uh, due to the phasing. In some cases, you actually have to cut through existing utilities to get to one part of the phase program to the other, which can create some challenges. It uh, draws out the construction process, and so you have additional costs from the general conditions. And most of all, it's just a uh, very disruptive process. Uh, we call it the visqueen effect. Uh, plastic is actually hung from the, the ceiling to close off parts of the kitchen that's under construction. There's a lot of noise. There's a lot of dust. And in the healthcare food service environment, air quality is very important. And uh, the hygiene of the, the workspace has to be maintained. So phase construction is a costly, uh, disruptive approach. One other option is to go to outsource uh, catering, where you can actually bring in food from outside catering. Um, that could be an option for a commercial application, but when you're dealing with healthcare or food service, you've got dietary requirements, you've got some security concerns, uh, not always an option to bring in outside food service. And of course, when you've got a uh, hospital full of patients, uh, shutting your kitchen down completely is just not an option. That's uh, very disruptive, of course. You've got to continue to feed your, your patients, your staff, your visitors. So shutting down the kitchen uh, typically is not an option for healthcare. Some of the benefits of a temporary kitchen, you now Ralph has really pointed out a number of these already, um, but one of them I really want to, a couple of them that I really want to key into are the last two, um, retain staff and maintain efficiency. Uh, training staff and maintaining staff is one of the biggest expenses that we all incur in any industry, particularly in food service. So to be able to be able to maintain that staff and keep them happy and employed you know, really plays out, particularly with all the changes that are going on in healthcare today, and alternatives are not always an option, as Ralph had said. Uh, you know, one, a, a term that we actually picked up from one of our clients, and Ralph mentioned earlier, was construction fatigue. And when you do this in phases, the construction fatigue just wears your folks out, be it the visqueen and the dust coming across, or having to kind of makeshift what you're doing. It just wears your people out. And, you know, it goes back to morale and some of the other things we've spoken about. So uh, those are a couple of points I really wanted to, to bring out here. Well, Scott, I know at the conference, at the HF conference, one of the, uh, the takeaways was it's all about people. And uh, whether those people are your staff or the folks that you're serving, the patients in the hospital, uh, they are a key part of that decision-making process. Right. Well, and particularly now, Ralph, with the Affordable Care Act, you know, and the customer satisfaction and the need for folks in the kitchens to be able to do more with less and the rating system and how that affects your revenues for the entire hospital, not just necessarily food service. So when you start getting into some of these other options and you lose control of your food service, you really can be deemed, for lack of a better word, uh, in regards to funds that you get from the insurance companies and the government for Medicare because of the Affordable, Affordable Care Act. So therefore, phase construction and uh, becomes a very, very difficult situation because you do lose a fair amount of control of what your food service is like. The other thing that happens, obviously, is that there are, in any hospital, uh, dietary restrictions and dietary regulations are the biggest, one of the biggest issues you deal with. So be it kosher or halal or specialty diets because of salt intake, food allergies, et cetera, uh, Doing it in a, an environment where you're outsourcing your food service or really cutting it back, you, you're doing your patients a real disservice and ultimately doing your hospital a disservice because it will cut down on the funds that they receive from the insurance companies and the government. So let's take a look at a few of our temporary kitchen complexes in action. First project we'd like to share with you today is a uh, project that's actually still in operation back at uh, the Walter Reed uh, National Military 
Medical Center, and what they did is they had a consolidation of the old Walter Reed Army Hospital, which was starting to fall into disrepair. I think you probably saw a lot of uh, coverage on the news about the quality of care and, and services being provided. They have merged that together with the Naval Medical Center to create the National Military Medical Center, and quite a complex, uh, a huge patient load, of course, especially with the number of uh, servicemen and women coming back from the theater. So uh, part of this solution of the new facility is to have a new uh, food service facility that will take care of that increased patient load. As an interim solution, we have put in place a modular complex. You can see the uh, floor plan up on the screen. You can see it's made up of a number of modules. In the back of the house, we have several production modules for the kitchen area supported by some uh, wash capability and cold storage. There's a survey that's been built out into a couple of modular units and then some uh, dining space. Uh, a large portion of this production actually gets uh, transported to the rooms in uh, food carts, and uh, this facility is also supported by a series of uh, toilets for the, the, the customers in the, the survey area. Taking a shot at the outside, this is a, a shot of the unit that was actually installed in a parking lot. And, uh, I, was talking to somebody this morning and found out that we actually took over the Admiral's parking space to make room for this. So everybody had to sacrifice a little bit for this interim kitchen solution. But it's got a very high profile. This whole program was uh, permitted through NAPFAC, which is the uh, essentially the military building department. Uh, quite an extended process that we had to go through to get approvals, but it is in place. It was initially uh, put in for a 14-month program. As Scott mentioned earlier, sometimes these programs run long, especially with health care approvals. And so it's been extended out to about 16 months. But it's a nice facility. You can see a shot here of the installation, the extension of utilities out to the site, uh, running power and water and waste to the, the kitchens themselves and cold storage. And then a shot of the, uh, the interior of the survey area. One of the requirements was they wanted sort of a fact action uh, expedited grill area for the, uh, the production of uh, sandwiches and some other um, items for the survey. So we put in a separate island hood. Just uh, an idea of a little bit of the flexibility. These, these units, even though they are an interim or temporary solution, can be configured, of course, to, uh, to be comparable to any uh, fixed site-built uh, facility. So just an option of what's available. Another one of the projects we wanted to highlight was uh, NYU New York University Langone Medical Center. Uh, as many of you know, or some of you may not, uh, back during Superstorm Sandy, they were completely put out of business as a hospital because of the uh, stormwater that came in over uh, the East River. So all of their kitchen and all of their utilities were all located in the basement of the hospital, and they ended up with about 14 feet of water. So the uh, kitchen was completely put out as well as the hospital was just taken down completely. So, but they still had a need to come back online as quickly as possible. Uh, as I said earlier, I'm a paramedic, and what happened was themselves and also Bellevue also went down. So what that created was a hole on the southeast corner of the island, and people were being transported across Manhattan. And if anybody's been to New York, transporting across Manhattan, even with the ability of an ambulance, uh, is difficult at best. So these two hospitals, and we work with NYU Langone, had to get their ERs, if nothing else, back up and running as quickly as possible because you had acute patients who were in need of services and they were being transported 20 and 30 minutes away because of traffic. So we were involved with NYU Langone. We got a call shortly thereafter from Betty Perez. Uh, Betty was referred to us by Dick Hines from Hobart. And again, those of you who know New York, there aren't parking lots like there were uh, for some of the other facilities. There's very little land. This is down on the far east side of town where, in fact, if you look off to the left, you really can't see it, but off to the left, the half a block is the East River. What we found, or what they found working with us, is that there was a rooftop that was available to an old parking garage, and we ended up about 14, 15 feet above ground, above the street. We brought in a 350-ton crane and lifted our units in place and placed them up onto this roof facility so that they were able to get back up and running. And uh, we, from the time we received the call until they were ready for operation, 
was 28 days. So we, were, we responded quickly. We got kitchens there. Uh, we were ready before they were ready. Uh, they still had to do some state approvals and some other things, but we were able to get that kitchen up and running. What we did for them, and as you can see in the center of the picture, it's a little, it was a small kitchen. We really didn't have a lot of room to work with, considering it was Manhattan. We put a lot of their equipment and their serving line on wheels because they, it was uh, the center of the module was used or the complex was used for setting up the trays for the client or the patients during one portion of the day, and it needed to be prep area for the other parts of the day. So we were rolling back and they were rolling back and forth tables and hot lines and cold lines and uh, plate warmers, et cetera, because they had to continuously flex that space so that they can take care of the patients in the hospital. Another one of the projects we really want to talk about today is Banner Thunderbird Medical Center. Uh, this was a project we did down in Arizona, just outside of Phoenix, and this was a project where they were building a brand new tower, and they needed to expand and completely renovate their food service, so they brought in a kitchen that was both for patients and also for the cafe, and they do a number of meals. They were doing about, between the two, they were doing close to 1,500 meals a day. One of the challenges we had was that they were also in the process of going to room service. So in our kitchens, we actually did the conversion with them from going from typical plate service to room service for their patients in the new towers. The picture you're looking at now, we actually took over an old heliport. They put the heliport on top of the, one of the brand new towers they had already built. So what we did was we took the kitchen uh, and put it on top of that existing heliport which was a little bit farther away than most times when we do that, but uh, it certainly worked for them. Uh, this next picture is you take a look, and Ralph was talking about utilities. You can see the electrical that they had to bring in for that. This project required sprinklers, and fortunately in the, in the southwest you don't have to worry about freeze, so there wasn't, it wasn't a very difficult thing for us to do, but obviously also air conditioning, and we made sure that it had significant air conditioning involved so that we were able to keep the folks in the kitchen comfortable. Uh, inside of the kitchen, you know, these were some of the large kettles. This was one of the two cook lines, uh, and as you can see, this is where they were making their soups and some of the stews and some of the other products. They also had some trundle kettles, grills, charbroilers, etc., to take care of all of the patients and also for the cafe. The uh, looking at this picture, you can see that was on the right was a dishwasher that was a flight type dishwasher with a dryer in the back area where you can't see there's a very tall gentleman there uh, in a white shirt in the back area because this had to be transported further down the line than typical they had a lot of carts that were exposed to the outside those carts needed to be clean we built a wet room inside of our modules so that all those modules all of those carts could be clean uh, as they came back you know on the right side Ralph kind of you see where some of the prep was done but uh, there's a uniqueness to our white walls, isn't there, Ralph? Yeah, the, uh, you can see some uh, writing on the wall there below the Ansel cabinet. Uh, we provide a smooth FRP interior wall finish that's actually a giant whiteboard. So whether it's over a prep station like you see in this picture or in your dry and, and cold storage, you can actually take the, uh, the right type of uh, raceable marker and, and actually write on the wall. So it's turned into a great uh, byproduct of the type of uh, material we use and uh, people have actually used this type of material in their permanent facilities because they've gotten used to the nice ability to communicate to the team. Hey, Ralph, on that subject, if I can add, uh, we, all of these kitchens come in and they are code compliant for health department. Our floors are coved up the wall. As Ralph mentioned, it's an antimicrobial white wall that we have on the, on the, on the side, so therefore it actually can be used for writing daily menus, et cetera, and it's also a washable ceiling tile so that you are dealing with, when you deal with your health departments, you can show them and we can present that they're dealing with the same kind of environment you would in your permanent kitchen. So, and then on this, Ralph, do you want to talk about how the carts were transported? Yeah, as Scott mentioned, we used a, a helipad uh, that was out there, there was available space. A lot of times space is uh, a premium for temporary kitchen locations. We were able to pick up the helipad and uh, install the complex, but that put it a ways away from the towers. 
So there were a series of little tugs that were used to move the food carts from the production facility into the patient towers, and it seemed to work out fine. Uh, they wasn't really too far away, and they were able to tug them in and get them to the patients. So if you've seen from some of these examples, the, the use of an interim or temporary kitchen facility is really a viable proof and concept. Uh, we believe it's a more cost-effective approach than phasing or bringing in outside food service or, of course, we discuss uh, shutting down the kitchen is not an option. In summary, um, temporary, condition, temporary kitchens are an ideal cost-effective and efficient solution for a multitude of food service challenges, namely a renovation or a remodel, new construction, increasing your capacity storage or volume requirements, or preparing or responding to disaster situations or emergencies. So this is really what we do, and, and this is the service we bring to you folks. And Scott, concerning emergencies, I know at the AHF conference we had a number of uh, conversations with folks that have been asked to update their emergency preparedness plan for the hospital. And of course, food service is a big part of that uh, due to the need to possibly shelter in place. So we are in the process of working on a program to actually provide uh, pre-written uh, portions that will address uh, interim food service to help uh, be part of that solution. So we'd welcome if people have an interest to contact us, and we'd, we'd be happy to share that kind of information with you. Okay, question and answer time. Um, we've had a couple of questions come in during the uh, webinar, and uh, what I'll do is I'll read those off, and then we'll see if we can provide an answer for you. First question is, can the temporary units be painted to match the existing hospital? The answer to that is yes. In fact, we just installed a complex at Charlotte Medical Center. Uh, it was made up of a series of uh, cold storage units, production units, and server units. And uh, at the end of the day, uh, since it was made up of a series of uh, non-similar components, we came back in and we painted the entire complex out to match the uh, appearance of the hospital so that it will blend in and look like it's part of the facility for the 18-month uh, period that it will be in place. Next question is, what type of uh, surface uh, do you need to put these on? Uh, Scott, you want to address that? Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, typically, a hard surface is, and as flat as possible, like I said, I was in operations, and many times salespeople come back and go, oh, yeah, it's flat and it's level. And what flat and level meant to them and what it meant to me was completely different. We work with all sorts of surfaces. You know, obviously, an ideal situation is if it's flat, hard, and level, um, and that is obviously ideal. If you have a surface that isn't quite as, uh, the conditions aren't quite as nice as that, that's something we need to take a look at and work with you. There are some other options. Uh, we've also put equipment on perimeter walls when we've attached them to other structures or if they want it to be a grade. So there are a number of different services that we work with. Uh, having one of us come out and meet with you, which is part of our process, and are excited to do that with all of you, is to take a look at what the site would be and determine how to best bring that project to fruition with the existing site conditions. The next question is, uh, which is the typical height of the containers? And uh, that really varies based upon the type of product. The, the modular units typically roll off the line at about 11 foot, uh, 6 inches high. And once uh, you put them on wheels to transport, they're, they're an overheight type load. The container units are built into what we call a high cube container, which is 9 foot 6 from the ground to the top of the uh, structure itself. So based upon the location and the application, uh, there are a number of different type of shells or envelopes out there that can meet those requirements. It's just a matter of uh, the equipment needs and the space needs and what type of envelopes are best uh, configured to meet those needs. Of course, another consideration has to do with the environmental conditions that you're going into. Uh, mobile units are, are very mobile and uh, are for short term, but you have to consider if it's a very hot or cold climate. If you're in a severe climate condition, it's probably better to use some type of uh, modular solution that has appropriate insulation and HVAC systems to address the uh, type of environmental conditions that it will be installed in. Right. And, and to add to that, Ralph, uh, 
if you don't do an excavation and bring the floor level down to grade, down to the same level as the street, if you will, um, the units typically set somewhere between 24 to 48 inches above grade. Our, our containerized system would typically sit about 24 inches up and we need some room underneath because you're, there's plumbing underneath and you have to gravity feed your waste lines. Our modulars typically set 36 inches above grade and then our 53 foot drive boxes, which we put our kitchens into, typically sit 48 inches above grade. And obviously those are all adjustable and we can adjust those to meet the needs, but that just gives you an idea of what your floor height is compared to grade. Thanks, Scott. Well, we uh, greatly appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to join us today to uh, discuss interim kitchen solutions for healthcare food service. We have uh, recorded this webinar. We'll be placing this webinar on our website at uh, www.ktg.com. So feel free to uh, go on our site and take a look at the recorded webinar. If you have a uh, team of folks that were not able to join you today, we'd be happy to either come out and provide a lunch and learn for your team on site or feel free, of course, to share the recorded webinar with them. Speaking of webinars, we have another webinar coming up on July the 17th. It is actually uh, designed for our friends with College and University Marketplace and we'll provide it uh, some information on what type of uh, solutions are available for that market. But again, we greatly appreciate uh, your time today, and hopefully this has been valuable for you. If you have additional questions, please reach out to our office at 630-355-1660 or drop an email off to Carrie. Uh, you see her email on the screen. Uh, again, thanks for joining us. Have a great day, and stay safe. Take care. Thank you, everybody.